This conference will now be recorded. All right, folks, good evening. Uh, I'm glad that you're here today, and we are going to be going over uh, Chapter 6, the integumentary system. Uh, in particular, the main component of that integumentary system would be the skin. And so we're going to be talking about uh, not only just the, uh, the structures and the function, but we're also going to be talking about some pathology and such. Okay, so let's begin by going into the slide presentation. There we go, the integumentary system, chapter six. And we'll see here as far as, so yeah, so the skin makes a, a really comprises a good majority of what we, when we're thinking of the integumentary system, this is what we're thinking of the skin and components that are a part of, so the accessory structures, the hair, nails, and glands, all right? And so we'll be looking at uh, images of the integumentary system. <coughs> and talking about the function and just, uh, again, discussing pathology. Uh, major issue here as far as the integumentary system really uh, acts as a protective covering. And again, it's waterproof. And really what's gonna happen is that it's going to help to keep everything within us um, a, a sealed environment, truly, okay? And then they'll have different aspects that there'll be openings present, but those openings will also have other structures structures present that will uh, enable an immune function to protect us from anything that can enter via the nasal cavity or the oral cavity, okay? And any other areas where we're having uh, openings, there'll be other uh, cells and structures present in order to protect us, okay, from the outside environment. So when we think of the skin, we need to remember that it's two components, the epidermis and the dermis. Now know that the subcutaneous layer, the AKA the hypodermis, so when you think of the skin, you think of the epidermis and the dermis, then understand that the hypodermis is not considered a part of the skin, but a supportive structure to the skin, okay? Um, so we think epidermis, we think the outer layer, it can have four to five layers. We'll talk about those in a few minutes here. Um, we realize that it's epithelial tissue, okay? And it's really, it's stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Now, keratinized, meaning that the outer layers of the epidermis are dead cells, right? So, and those dead cells, the cytoplasm, the guts of the inner portion of the cell have been replaced with keratin, a protein, okay? And so this also, that keratinized uh, outer layer, uh, really that stratum corneum, that outer layer, allows for this ability to have this waterproofing of our integument. Um, somebody has their phone, their, yeah, thank you, okay. All right, folks, so then we go to, and then again, knowing that as far as from histology purposes there, um, information, we know that epithelial tissue is avascular. So if it's avascular, there needs to be a vascularity present, so blood vessels need to be close by in order to allow for nourishment to take place of this uh, keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. And so this is how you need to, when, when we're in the lab and we're doing our lab practical, you'll need to be able to say, you'll need to be able to uh, write down for me on the answer sheet, if you see this uh, epidermis and you see, uh, you see st keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue, that's how you have to label it as, please. Okay? Now, then we go to the supportive layer of this epidermis, and it's called the dermis. Now, the dermis contains two different types of tissue, okay? So this very um, one-fifth of the layer of the dermis, the very top area there, contains what's called the dermal papillae. There's these little bumps. So let's go here, and I'm going to move for a moment here to another show you again. So, so take a look at this image here, folks, and we'll go back to where we were, but you see this structure that I'm outlining right here, okay? These are the bumps. These are these bumps. These are the dermal papillae, okay? Uh, let's see if we can find another. Here we go. So you see in this image here, so you see this bump right here, bump right here, right here, right here. Those are dermal papillae. So we have the epidermis and we have the dermis layer. And then here is the hypodermis, aka the subcutaneous layer, uh, comprised primarily of fat. Okay, so let's move back to where we were, beginning of the PowerPoint. 
Yeah. All right, so we have this dermis layer. So the dermal papillae, these little bumps, okay, that's the very top layer, the superior, superior most layer of the dermis having direct contact with the epidermis. And so know that, and this dermal papillae and the type of tissue, it's areolar connective tissue. Recall that tissue is the packing tissue. When we look at it, it's very distinct. We're seeing uh, thick layer, thick um, fibers of collagen fibers. They're kind of pinkish. And then we'll see like dark lines present within this type of tissue, areolar connective tissue. And those represent elastic fibers. And then you'll see cells interspersed. So that's the type of tissue that's present in the dermal papillae. And it's very vascular. There's a lot of blood vessels there. So uh, the reticular layer, of the dermis is vascular, has a lot of vascularity, so that we can then what? Bring nourishment to the epith epithelial tissue of the epidermis. Does that make sense to you all? That because the epidermis is avascular, no blood vessels, then that reticular layer of the dermis needs to have blood vessels present in order to nourish, in order to also give oxygen to the uh, epidermis, cell layers, the actually basal layers of the epidermis, that lower bottom layer of the epidermis, of the stratified squamous epithelial tissue keratinized. Now, the remainder portion of the dermis consists of, we call this the papillary layer, right? So the reticular, the papillary, the, so we would have then, actually, so that, hold on. Dense irregular connective tissue, okay? So dense irregular connective tissue, you recall when we saw that uh, dense irregular connective tissue, that was the type of tissue where it has collagen fibers going in all different types of directions. So you're only seeing pieces of those uh, fibers going in different directions, and that would be the dense irregular connective tissue present within the dermis. And so this would be the four-fifths of the, uh, the dermis there, okay? And then we get to the subcutaneous or the hypodermis layer, which would contain, which would contain the uh, adipose tissue, fat. Okay, let's move on here. And let's go to, we're seeing here, so this, you're not seeing the dermal papillae too well, to be honest here, okay? So you're seeing a little bit right here, this bump, that bump, okay? Uh, here's another bump. But really, on in the in the uh, in the lab, in our model, you're going to see it very uh, very easily as far as these bumps present within the uh, the dermal papillae of the dermis. Okay, so let's move on here. So the epidermis. So the epidermis again, it's stratified squamous type tissue. So there's multiple layers, and know that at the outermost layer of the squamous tissue. Those are, so that very top layer of the stratified squamous tissue, they're flat cells. They're flat squamous pancake shaped cells. And they're again, dead cells. Notice also that they're dead cells. So this, the cytoplasm has been replaced with keratin, the protein. Okay. Keratinization, this is just the ability for the uh, cells as they reach the surface of this epidermal layer of these, the layers of the epidermis, as it reaches the outermost layers, the cells begin to die as they move up the layers. Again, I said to you before that, that there's either four or five layers, thin or thick skin. So thick skin, we would think on the palms of our hands and the soles of our feet, okay? So know that's what's going on as far as uh, thick or thin skin. And so there can be either five or four layers of this epidermis. And there's there's, uh, we, we actually name them, and I'm going to talk to you about that in just a moment and give you a mnemonic that's not mine, but that I think is a very easy one to uh, help you to understand and learn. So different types of cells present within the epidermis. So we have these melanocytes. Melanocytes are actually uh, a melanin producing cell, right? Site, cell, uh, melano having to do with the pigment. So these are producing pigmentation. All right, and melanosomes are the actual peg, um, packages of this pigmentation that's entering into the epithelial cells. Keratinocytes are these uh, cells that will actually produce the protein keratin that will uh, replace the cytoplasm of the cells as they move 
outer and outer into the most the outermost layers of uh, the epidermis. Uh, dendritic cells are cells present that will actually uh, be involved in the immune response. And in particular, we will be talking more about these cells when we get into um, AMP2, okay? So know that when we're discussing the lymphatic system and the immune system function, uh, we'll be talking about these dendritic cells. Know that they are very important in uh, presenting uh, different types of antigens. These would be something that could make you sick, okay? So these antigens would be actually broken down and presented on the outer portion of the, actually the, uh, the plasma membrane of the dendritic cells and will help to activate uh, the actual specific immune response of the body. Merkel cells are types of uh, sensory receptor cells that are present that are involved in light touch and pressure. And so here we're seeing as far as the actual uh, melanocytes with the melanin present within and the melanosomes are present within here in order to carry the packages of the, the uh, melanin, the pigment, into the cells, allowing for a coloration, a pigmentation of the, uh, the integument of the skin. So here's this mnemonic regarding um, the five layers. So this would represent thick skin. Know that, that, and let me put this here so you, you could make a note here. So this lucidum layer, so the lucidum layer, so actually, so this would be, so let me give you what it is. So corneum. Lucidum. granulosum, okay, and then no some, and the basal layer. Okay, so these are the layers. This would be the outermost layer. Okay. And lucidum layer only present in thick skin. All right, so we have come, let's get sunburned. We start from the outermost layer for five layers, right? Thick skin. And so we have corneum lucidum, granulosum spinosum, basal layer, okay? So these are the five layers in thick skin. Lucidum is not present in thin skin, which would be the majority of your body other than the soles of your, palms of your hand and the soles of your feet. That would be thick skin, so that would be five layers, and that lucidum layer, it's a lucid layer. When we say someone is lucid, really know that lucid, clear. Clear layer, very good. So if you wanna take a moment and write down this information, I'll give that to you to do. So take a moment there and uh, write that information down, please. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> and I'm looking at the slide and I'm gonna make a correction to the slide presentation. And I'm like, wait a second, why is that wrong? Yeah. Frustrating, but uh, I'm going to I'm going to make a correction to our PowerPoint in just a moment because as I was reading it, I'm like, wait, that's wrong. That's not correct. So I'm going to take care of that in a moment. But just write this information down, please. Okay. All right. So I'm going to escape this for a moment. I'm going to go back to this layer. And as I was reading it, I'm like, wait a second. Why is that? That's not right. Okay. So 
let's look here for a moment here, folks, please. So <laughs> this, I don't know why I did this live when I was putting this together. I apologize for that. Because the dermal papillary would be in the papillary layer and the thicker layer would be the reticular layer. So apologize for that. So please do me a favor and just take a moment and make a correction to your PowerPoints and to your notes, please. So I made a correction here and I'll also post the corrected PowerPoint to the uh, to the website, but you can do this right now. But I wanna make sure that you have a, a corrected uh, presentation. So I will uh, take care of that. I'm sorry about that, you know. Uh, <laughs> But see, know that the papillary layer, again, it's about one-fifth of the dermis, and the reticular layer, about four-fifths of the dermis. And as I was looking at it, I knew it was wrong, and I'm like, wait a second, let me just check and confirm that. And yeah, so very good. We're all set. So papillary layer, one-fifth, superiormost layer of the dermis, reticular, four-fifths of the dermis. Okay? Very good. Let's move on here to... So let's look at this image that I have posted in the PowerPoint there. And you'll see here that we have the basal layer. So let's look at here for a moment. So come, let's, and then we see here as far as the, and this, this one, this image is not showing the granulosum, but then we have the spinous layer. Yeah, granular layer, sorry. Yeah, come, and you're not seeing the, actually this is thin skin. That's why we're not seeing the uh, the lucidum layer, the clear layer. That's why this is four four layers. So we have then come, there's no lucidum layer because it's thin skin. So then we have granulosum, spinosum, and basal layer. Now, so you'll see here that live cells, right? These are live cells. This is the area where we have much mitosis. Mitotic division is taking place in the basal layer. So the stratum basale, basal layer, that is where mitotic division is taking place. The basal layer, right? This bottom layer, this is also where we have a interaction between the papillary layer, the dermal papillae, which is very vascular, right? So we're having these blood vessels feeding the basal layer. So we have mitotic division taking place here. New cells are here. Now, as the cells move towards the outer layer, okay, and this is four layers for a thin skin, five layers for thick skin, having the, the uh, lucidum layer would be right here that clear layer in thick skin. So we have the cells are actually dying as they move superior word, right? And they're then what? As a result of that, those uh, keratinocytes, right? That are producing keratin, the protein, they're going to replace, keratin will replace the cytoplasm of the cells. These cells are dead now. They are no longer live cells, but they act as a protective barrier that will uh, be waterproof for the skin and see where it says desquamating, meaning that they just, they the cells will just slough off. They'll just come off of the skin, the dead cells over time. You know this and you see this because when you look at the window, say you have, you're looking at your window and sunlight's entering into the room, right? So it's a dark room, you have sunlight entering in and in the sunlight, you can see little dots, right? You can see little, you see the particles, the particulate matter, that's primarily that dust, is primarily dead skin cells. I have to tell you, that's the majority of it, that's dead skin cells present within the air that you are breathing in your house. Now, if you have animals or pets, that pet dander is also a part of that equation in the air of your home, okay? So let me stop the presentation for a moment and just see if we have, um, stop sharing my screen for a moment here. I'm going to show everybody for a moment. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments at all? Any questions or comments? Okay. Uh, yes, actually, my my sure. internet kind of worked out on me on um, okay. um, number six. Did we? Did I miss anything um, worth noting other than what you put in in our point PowerPoint in number six? Number six. You mean slide number six? Correct. Yes. The, with the epidermis, the stratified, the squamous. So. Number six is just showing us that it's a stratified, keratinized, stratified squamous, keratinized epithelium. I didn't add anything to it. No, I did okay. not add anything to it, okay? All right, yeah, thank you. Good. All right, 
Anybody else have any other questions or comments? Are we okay? All right. Um, hold on, I have a question. I just sure. I lost the PowerPoint. Um, it was about the avascular and vascular. Are you saying the top portion of the no. Here's or the saying. entire thing is okay. avascular? Very good. So good question. So really all epithelial tissue, no matter what type of epithelial tissue, it's avascular. Okay, no blood vessels present within. So stratified squamous epithelial tissue, all five or four layers, depending upon where you're at in the body, are avascular. Okay. okay. It's the same tissue. It's the same tissue. So all five or four layers, it's the same tissue, stratified squamous epithelial tissue, keratinized. Now, non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue would be present in, say, like the digestive tract, <coughs> where it's not exposed to the outer environment like your skin is, right? So that would be live cells at the very apical surface, at the top layer. Understood? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Good. All right. So let me go. Let me just ask, see who else. I tried rewatching the previous lecture. It wouldn't allow me any suggestions. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so Jen, so here's the key. Here's the issue here. Uh, when you're trying, when I share the videos with you all, my, my recommendation is um, that you can even like to have some kind of recording device or it does, it might give you an option to record, all right? I, I can reshare something with you if you let me know. I can go back into my the program and share, but I share it with you all the whole class at the same time. So make sure that you watch it as soon as possible and try and either do one, try and record if you have an account with them, okay? If not, um, it really, I, I don't know other way just to that I'm, I do the initial sharing. And then if you watch the video and maybe like take a recording of it, like with your phone, as far as like even just the audio, um, that that's an option. I'm sorry, I, I'm still, uh, that's about the best I can do as far as with the old uh, old lectures, okay? Um, you're having practice, yeah, so, uh, let, let me look here. Yeah, so on, correct. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. So on 1026, you are having your lab practical number one, right, as well as test number two. So I'm going to have um, somebody, I think it's going to be uh, Dr. Van Dorsen, will be, when I'm working with those that are in the practical, she will be uh, doing a proctoring of test number uh, two in the lab, and then you're in the, in a, the room next door, 214, then you're going to switch. And when someone, when the class is doing uh, the practical number one, the other one is doing the test number two. Okay. Yeah. So that, that'll be at the same time on 1026. Um, those of you that are having a uh, lab on Monday, you, so that would be group B, lab group B, you will be then taking test number one first, and then we will be going over and doing videos of uh, the uh, skeletal system, not the skull, we already did that, but all the other bones and such, and creating like short videos that you'll be able to, I'll be reviewing all of the parts. And again, you your practical number one will be on 1026 in one month, a little bit less than one month. Yeah, you're welcome, Michelle, no problem. Does anybody I, else have any? Go ahead, go ahead. Can you explain the Merkel, um, the Merkel cells again? What do you mean by light touch and pressure? Yeah, so they're just involved in, so they're just like sensory receptor cells that are just involved in, so light touch. So, so you know, your your skin, right? You mm -hmm. have the ability to have either light touch or more deeper oh, touch, okay, right? Okay, okay. That kind of a thing, that's all, as simple as that. Yeah, they're just receptor type cells, part of the nervous system, okay? All right, I'm going to now, you're welcome. I'm gonna hide everyone and I'm going to share my screen and continue on. And we'll go about another uh, 15 or so minutes, and then we'll take a five minute break, and then we'll finish up the PowerPoint. Okay, so let's move here. Okay, good, so let's, yeah, here we go. So we're going over and we're looking at the epidermis. And so what we're seeing here is that, uh, again, thick and thin skin, five and four layers. We looked at the cells mnemonic and now let's look at those layers again we're talking about those layers so we know that the corneum layer that stratum corneum is the outermost layer okay so that outermost layer dead keratinized cells the uh, cytoplasm has been replaced with keratin the protein uh, and 
pretty much it. So it's acting as a barrier. Uh, in particular, it allows for your, your integument, your skin to be waterproof, okay? As a result of that keratin protein uh, being present within those dead cells of the uh, stratified squamous epithelial tissue, right? The stratum lucidum, again, this is only present within the uh, five layers of thick skin on your sole, uh, your palms of your hand and your soles of your feet. Um, only very a thin layer, right? One to two, two cell layers thick, okay? Uh, flat, clear, right? I said, if someone is lucid, lucid in their thinking, they're clear in their thinking. So that's why we call this the uh, flat, clear, transparent layer is the stratum lucidum. Granulosum, this is the middle layer of thick skin. So it's number three as far as thick skin is concerned. Active uh, keratinization is taking place. So really we're producing keratin and we're replacing the cytoplasm of the cells with keratin in this layer right here. So they're losing their nuclei, right? So they're really losing the cytoplasm of the cell is being replaced with this keratin, right? The spinosum, they call it this because several layers of spiny shaped cells. That's the reason why they call it the spinosum layer. And this is really closest to the bottom layer, which would be then what? The basal layer, okay? So we have this basal layer. It's also known as, and you need to know this term, so AKA also known as the germinativum uh, layer. Okay, that's that very basal layer, that bottom layer that's resting on the basement membrane. So it's it's anchoring to the dermis via the basement membrane. And it's that papillary layer of the uh, dermis that is anchoring to the basal layer of this epidermis. Okay. And again, remember that um, that basal layer, highly mitotic mitotic division is taking place, new cells are being produced, and those cells are being pushed, pushed, pushed out. And as they are pushed out, they start to die, and the, the cytoplasm is replaced with keratin, the protein. Okay. So here we looked at this image earlier there. And so you're seeing that at the very apical surface, here we have dead cells, no nuclei present, and they're replaced with uh, the keratin is replacing the cytoplasm. But the very bottom layer, the basal layer, right? That doesn't look like squamous cells, does it really? I mean, you know, it's looking a little bit different than that, but but know that we don't identify tissue by, if it's multiple layers, we don't identify it by the basal layer. We always identify it by the, what we call the apical surface, the top layer of tissue that's multiple layers. Again, the epidermis is epithelial tissue, and it's avascular. Now look here too, as far as the dense irregular tissue is concerned, can you see all those fibers that have been, they're kind of, you're not seeing full fibers because they're they're in different directions. Because again, I mentioned to you how we can move the skin in different directions. We can move the epidermis and it stays anchored to the deeper layers of skin via this, really these uh, collagen fibers present in different directions of the uh, the reticular layer of the dermis. Okay? So the dermis contains blood and lymph vessels, lymphatic vessels, contains nerves, muscles, glands, follicles, hair follicles, which will have live cells present. The hair, once it ends up, you know, I don't have a whole lot of it here, but once it ends up exiting from the integument and coming out into the surface, it's it's dead, it's dead, right? But the deeper layers, that's the live tissue and live cells. Right. So can you can you really feed hair? The only way that you would feed hair is not by conditioners and things that you could put on the hair, but really it's by uh, nutrients and you can feed the hair and vitamins, right? So here we have again, so papillary and reticular. I don't know why that cell that slide was wrong. I, I don't understand what I, I crazy, you know. Anyhow, but here you know you see it, it's right as far as papillary layer. This is where the dermal papillae are present. Uh, areolar connective tissue, the reticular layer, four fifths, dense irregular connective tissue. Okay. And when we think of the skin, we think of the dermis and the the epidermis and the dermis. Good. All right. So the cells of the dermis. So we have fibroblasts. So know that there are fibers present within the dermis, and we we saw. So as far as the papillary layer has this uh, these 
areolar connective tissue, we've seen that in the lab, that there are fibers present, elastic fibers, collagen fibers, and we've seen also with the dense irregular connective tissue, uh, the collagen fibers present. So uh, we know that we need then cells that are producing fibers, so we have these fibroblasts. Adipocytes, adipocytes are fat cells, okay? So fat cells, fat, actually adipose tissue, is present in the dermis. You'll see that there's interspersed, there's some fat uh, present within. Also, primarily it's at the hypodermis, aka the uh, subcutaneous layer, is primarily where we have adipose tissue. Macrophages are also a type of, so can, give me one moment here. I want to just come back for a moment. So that is at number 18. Excuse me for scrolling through here. Yeah, so you see where this says dendritic cells? They're antigen presenting cells, right? They're a part of our immune system and the immune process of, of activating the specific portion of our immune system. Well, I'm going to tell you that not only are dendritic cells antigen presenting cells, but macrophages are also a an antigen presenting cell, and they will be actively involved in phagocytosis, cell eating, in order to take any cell that is non-self, it will, it will uh, phagocytize it, bring it into the cell itself, the macrophage, and then present, have pieces of this uh, antigen that could cause, that has initiated some type of immune response to present on the outer plasma membrane of the macrophage and also activate the specific immune response. Uh, very important. And know that uh, macrophages, not only will they attack cells that are non-self, but they'll also be the cleanup crew and remove dead cells or dying cells within the uh, body. Okay, And those macrophages can either be uh, moving within the blood or staying stationary in different areas of the body. Very important type of cell. So I said to you that the skin, if, if someone were to ask you, and if there were a question that said, the skin is comprised of the epidermis and the dermis, that would be correct. The skin is not comprised of the hypodermis. The hypodermis is a supportive layer, but it's not part of the skin. It's just supportive of the skin. So when we think skin, think epidermis and dermis. So the subcutaneous layer, the hypodermis, contains primarily, like I said before, adipose tissue as well as areolar connective tissue. So we saw areolar connective tissue present in the papillary layer of the dermis as well as in the hypodermis, okay? The term striae is known as stretch marks, okay? We're gonna see that as far as that type of uh, uh, injury to the skin, and we're gonna look at an image in just a moment. Uh, cleavage lines, cleavage lines are important to surgeons because what happens is that as these collagen and elastic fibers are going in a, primarily in a certain direction, this is really how surgeons can minimize the damage to the tissue when they cut into the skin. If they go along those cleavage lines, there will be quicker healing and, uh, and less scar tissue formation going with those cleavage lines than going across them. So let's take a look at this image here. So you'll see ventral meaning anterior, dorsal meaning posterior. This is primarily how the lines of the body of these different types of fibers will be moving in these types of directions, okay? Um, when we look at the, uh, the skeletal system, you'll also see how collagen fibers, really the strongest type of protein fibers, collagen fibers, very important in the structure of the human body. These collagen fibers are present within bone and they actually will go in, fibers will go in different directions in order to give more strength to bone. Pretty cool stuff. So, uh, so you'll see here, as far as these cleavage lines, surgeons know exactly how these lines are going. And so they will try to cut with the line, right? So here we have the lower right quadrant, right? In through in here, so primarily you're thinking of uh, your appendix in this region, right? And so know that they would wanna cut in such a way that they're going along with these uh, fibers, right? With these cleavage lines and not against them. So if they were to make a cut like this, right? In this direction, um, instead of going with the fibers. If they go with the fibers, quicker healing, less scar tissue formation. Enough said with that. Okay, let's see what time we're at here. I right, got a few more minutes. Uh, skin color, 
So pigmentation of the skin, right? So we're going to be talking about pigments. We're going to be talking about the presence of blood and how that can affect the color. Because if we have, if we're flush, if we're really, you know, we've been exercising or we're embarrassed and we have a rush of blood to the skin, that will create an increase in pigmentation. Uh, and if lighter skin coloration, you can see it easier as far as then uh, more of a reddish and ruddy look to the, the skin. Uh, also, the thickness of the stratum corneum, this outer layer, can also cause a, a change in, a, in the coloration of the skin, especially on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. So melanin, primarily a brown black, but also could be red, brown, red yellow pigmentation, so those pigments are present. And combinations of these pigments allow for the different color presentations of, of the uh, human skin, which is, which is really, honestly, when you, when you look at humanity and see the, uh, the different colorations of skin and such, how cool is that? That it's, we're not all just one color. You know, there's such variety to how we all look as far as our presentation of our bodies, as well as, you know, the proportions of our different structures, our nose and our mouth and our ears, and, and whether we have more of an oval-shaped face or a round face or a more triangular, whatever it may be. Um, and the colors also make for such a, a variety of humanity. I, you know, that's wonderful. And, and not wonderful that people use that in order to treat others poorly because they don't look like them, right? We all get that, that's just foolishness. And it's sad, it really is very sad that these kind of things still go on today and will probably go on for the rest of humanity's existence. But we can do our part in trying to be, uh, and to be loving and kind to others, right? And so that's why we get into the healthcare profession anyway, in order to be kind and loving to our patients and show and, and do great service and deliver excellent quality care so that we can help humanity and make a difference in the world and, and you know, good stuff, right? So that's, we need to be uh, shining lights in a world that there's a lot of sadness and darkness, unfortunately, and, and foolishness. And we need to be a voice of reason in a world that sometimes doesn't seem like reason is a big uh, part of what pe how people think, right? So let's move on as far as, the uh, the term albinism, right, or it should be an absence of pigmentation, and this can be in any uh, type of um, culture that we see, and any type of uh, whether it's in Asian culture, whether it's in um, uh, people with Mediterranean culture, whether it's in African culture, no matter what types of uh, peoples that people groups that we see, albinism can be present. It also is not only just present in humanity, but it's also present in uh, the uh, populations of the different animals and such. And to see, uh, if I, I recall, um, my mother-in-law does volunteer work at, uh, it's in like a Princeton area, and it's called Grounds for Sculpture. And they have these uh, pheasant, I uh, know, what's the one? A peacock, peacocks, that's what it is. And peacocks have these beautiful colors and the feathers are really cool. But there's also, they had a um, albino peacock which was all white. And know that it's quite interesting that um, the other peacocks were kind of mean to it. It was pretty sad actually, but they still took care of the peacock and worked with them and such. But, uh, but these peacocks will just roam the grounds. And uh, interesting how you know, they, would have, they would treat poorly this poor uh, one that was uh, an albino that lacked any kind of uh, pigmentation in its, uh, its uh, feathers and such. Carotene. Carotene is this yellow pigmentation. We'll see it in carrots, sweet potato, and such. Um, these are usually uh, types of vegetables that are kind of sweet in taste. And so we'll find that um, infants, babies, will like these kinds of uh, foods better than they will the uh, types of food that do not have this pigmentation. Uh, so like they'll like them better than maybe like peas or green beans or spinach, right? And so if kids <laughs> kind of gravitate toward these kinds of vegetables and such, uh, they can actually develop more of a pigmentation of a uh, uh, this little bit of like this yellowing uh, to their, an orange type of a pigmentation to their skin if they eat too much of these vegetables. Yeah. Here, I think we'll end with, uh, yeah, we'll end with these three slides here. So this is a representation of vitiligo. 
and know that. Um, so I have a, a relative who, so my skin is maybe like lighter, but still pigmented and, and such and very, and we have a relative who has vitiligo. So here you see it on someone who has darker skin, but it doesn't matter what uh, nationality you're coming from, all cultures can be susceptible to vitiligo. And we believe that it's more of an autoimmune disorder that's attacking the melanocytes, the cells that produce melanin pigmentation. And so there's a lack of pigmentation in certain areas of the body. Albinism you're seeing here as far as that will have a, a lack of pigmentation in the hair and the skin, in the iris, um, true, you know, where we're looking at where we can see that um, there's more of like blood vessels and like pinkish. So you'll see here that that's a little bit hard to see, but there's more of like, you're seeing the blood actually showing through in the pigmentation of the iris. And know that this hole right here is called the pupil. Okay. All right, so let's see what time we're at here. Yeah, so I think we're gonna take a five minute break. So it's 5.30 right now. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment. I'm going to, Come out here and just talk with you all first. Someone has a question. What's going to be on the practical and on test number two? Yeah, so um, the practical exam, I can give you that. Test number two, I'm not going to give you that tonight. Um, but if you you can send me an email and I'll, and I'll make sure that I'll send that out to everybody because I can't just give it to you off the top of my head. I'm sorry. But I can tell you that uh, the practical exam is going to contain the tissues, right? So histology, those, all the slides. I'm not going to have all of the slides in the practical exam, but I will pull from the slides to add to the exam. So you have 20 types of tissues that you need to be able to identify, as well as the um, the bones and the model as far as the torso model, right? So we went over the torso model, we did the uh, histology, and we're going to be finishing up with group B, uh, the skeletal system. So we looked at the skull already for all the groups, and then then group B will also have the opportunity to look at all the other parts of the skeletal system and look at the holes and the parts of the uh, human skeletal system, okay? Yeah, and so they believe that Michael Jackson might have suffered with that, Jen, yeah, of uh, vitiligo. There's no word bank, folks. Yeah, so really, you know, like that would be, so spelling does count, right? So if you're if you're off by a letter, I can be a little bit understanding, but really, you know, spelling should count, folks. You should know exactly what these words are. So, so part of your studies can not only be to listen to the words of the practical exam. So you should take the word, the word bank that I've already provided for you, but you're not going to be able to use in the practical. But that word bank that I've given to you all, you should read it into some type of uh, MP3 player or your phone and create a sound file and listen to those words. And you know what, also, in order to know and own those words, right, to memorize those words, you should also write them out and write them out multiple times. That's also another way to make sure that you're able to memorize these words so that when it comes time to taking the test, it's gonna come to you. It's not gonna be something that you've just looked down paper and that's it. No, it's something that you've looked on paper, you've spoken, and you've also listened to that being spoken and you've written it down. Do you see all the more of the senses that you incorporate into studying for uh, some type of material? You'll, it helps it helps you to be able to learn that material. So uh, doing your flashcards, uh, doing the coloring books are very helpful folks because you're, you're coloring, you're associating colors with the terms, you're looking at the terms, you're looking at the structures. You have to really do multiple things in order to memorize this information and material. Make sense? All right, folks, so let's look at the time here right now. We're going, I'm going to hide everyone from the camera, and we're still recording, so we're just taking a five-minute break, and then we're going to come back and finish up the PowerPoint. So we're at 5.33. So at 5.38, we will begin our presentation. See you at 5.38, folks.
Okay, everyone. So we're going to come back to our presentation here. So I'll give you just a moment to uh, get back in front of the, your computers there. Okay, so I'm going to hide everyone and share my screen. And we'll continue on with our PowerPoint presentation. Very good. So we're going back into and looking at skin color. And so the presence of blood, how this can be an issue and how this can affect our skin color. So whether there is a, a lot of blood present or not a whole lot of blood present. In the case of cyanosis, and so a bluish type tinge to the skin can be as a result of a decrease in the oxygen content present within the blood and within the body and produce this pale type look, right? Uh, and even bluish in, in color. We've all seen this on, on little kids with their lips or their fingertips, their, their nails and such can have this bluish type, you know, washed out color uh, as a result of uh, them being very cold in like say a pool or something, okay? Uh, as far as the, ap the presence of quite a bit of blood, again, I said to you being flush and having this uh, increase in blood flow, yeah, the vasodilation would be that um, the blood vessels are increasing, they're, they're getting larger in size and allowing more blood flow to come to them as a result, bringing more blood to the uh, skin. And really it's your body's method of trying to cool you down and release heat via the blood to the skin surface. That's why when you touch someone who's very warm to the touch, they're very, they have a lot of, uh, they're flush, right? That you can feel they, they've been exercising or they're just embarrassed. You know, their, their skin, if it's red, it kind of feels warm to the touch. Or in the case of inflammation, the inflammatory process, if they have an issue with uh, a joint that they've injured and it becomes all red, that also has this warm feeling because there's more blood coming to the area. In the case of cyanosis, here we have that bluish tinge, a coloring, coloration of and uh, clubbing also of these nails as a result of someone who's experiencing respiratory disorder and issues as far as oxygenation of the tissues. The uh, thickness of the corneum, this would be that outer layer of your uh, epidermis, and so yellowish and thicker areas, so calluses, right? So a callus as a result of doing some type of repetitive movement and motion um, can put pressure in different areas of the integument and lead to an increase in the number of layers of that corneum and giving a different appearance to them. Um, also, uh, corns are calluses over bony prominence, especially when you're thinking of the, the, the feet, lower extremity. Now, the hair. So the hair, we have the cuticle, the cortex, and the medulla. So the medullary region would be the inner region of the, uh, the hair itself. The shaft is the visual, visual portion that we see. The root would be the actual area where the hair follicles present and the live cells are present. So the shaft, again, we said that this would be uh, dead cells, but at the root, right, in the hair follicle would have contained the live cells. Erector pili are muscle, smooth muscle in particular, that are attached to, connected to the hair, and uh, will allow, if contracting, they will allow the hair to stand on end. And so here we're seeing as far as here's the shaft, here would be anything below, below the, the uh, skin, the integument, would be then the root. Here we have the, the uh, hair follicle itself containing the different live cells and such. And so you have, again, the cuticle, the outer layer, the cortex, and then medulla, the medullary layer is the inner portion of the actual uh, hair itself. Now you can see here also that in addition to this muscle, so this muscle, it's being covered partially by the oil gland, the sebaceous gland. Here's that smooth muscle, the erector pili. Here we have a sebaceous gland, an oil producing gland that will allow for oil to uh, be on the uh, root and the shaft in order to keep it soft, right? So again, we say that we're not feeding hair by taking lotions or conditioners and such or shampoos. No, we're feeding hair by taking nutrients into our body or actually taking in vitamins to our body, right? Hair growth, right, takes place at the follicle, right, deep within the tissue. Um, there are cycles of growth and rest, important that you know that. Uh, genetics can control as far as if hair is straight, curly, 
or tightly curly, right? It all depends upon your genetics. Um, simple enough with that. Here we have vellus hair and terminal hair. So when you're looking at your, your hair on your head, this would be terminal hair. When you're looking at vellus hair, it's very fine type hair. So think of more um, females having on their, their legs and in different other areas of the body, this vellus hair, um, it's very fine type hair that you're seeing, uh, but it's very fine. The terminal hair is really hair that you can have, really is easier to, to see and to visualize. The nails, as far as the uh, structures that are present for the nails, we have that crescent would be the lunula, okay? The body is the visible portion of the nail, and then the root is covered by the skin, okay? Growth occurs from the nail bed and then pushes outward, right? Into the, out of, out of the, from deep within the skin, right? In that nail root. So here you're just seeing as far as there's the nail body. This is actually what you're seeing. There's the lunula, that uh, crescent, white crescent area, okay? Sebaceous gland. So we have within the integument um, sweat glands and sebaceous glands. So the sebaceous glands are producing oil, lubricating the skin and hair, right? And know that that there are there's more of a secretion of oil as a patient reaches puberty, okay? And as we get as we develop and get older in life, also that oil production will decrease, and the hair really um, for an older patient will will be a little bit different in how it, it if you ask your um, older patients in particular the females but also the males too that have hair on their head um, and it just it the hair reacts differently than it did many years ago because of uh, not so much oil that's being produced um, as a result just like any other body system uh, systems slow down and don't produce as much as they did. Um, as a patient was younger. Now know that, right? Um, they're very numerous on the palms and the soles of your feet. Uh, and anybody who has had children, in particular, uh, <laughs> those that are involved in sports, you know, like uh, sneakers can be pretty stinky as a result of uh, the amount of sweat that's being produced as a result of physical activity and such, okay? Uh, and sweating really does help to, the evaporation of the sweat on the body helps to cool the body. Thermoregulation, we call that. Thermoregulation, right? There are different types of sweat glands. So know that at puberty, right? At puberty, apocrine sweat glands are very important, okay? And they're present in the axilla and the pubic area, as well as the anus, and they're active at puberty. So do you see the AP, apocrine, axilla, pubic, active? puberty, right? So you see how that just kind of helps you to think a little bit regarding apocrine sweat glands. They're active at puberty and they're present primarily in the, the armpits, the axilla, pubic regions, right? And they also are producing a little bit of an odor because they're a little bit more, um, there's a different uh, structure to the sweat in comparison to the merocrine sweat glands, whereas like on, on, the, on your forehead, on your scalp, um, on your body, it's more of a, a, a lighter, thinner fluid, whereas in the, those regions, in the axle, the pubic region, they, that can be more of a little bit more of a thicker type fluid. And really the bacteria that are um, really um, using that for food can cause uh, an odor, okay? Um, also, there are sensory receptors in the integument, right? So whether it's for temperature or pressure, Right, whether it's light or, or deep pressure, um, and depending upon where they're located in the integument can really be an important aspect also, okay? Protection, right? So know that there's a slight acidity to the skin, to the integument. We call that the acid mantle, and this will kill many, many bacteria, right? So acid will kill many bacteria, not all bacteria. And know that um, really that this, an acid would be anything below, right, 7.0 as far as on the pH scale. So a number below 7.0, so 6.9 and below would be acidic pH, right? 
thermoregulation. I used this term earlier there, right? So um, as far as if when the external temperatures increase, blood vessels will dilate, right? So we, we have a flush, you know, reddish, ruddy look to us. And because the blood vessels are, are increasing in their, their size, the lumen is increasing. So that's vasodilation and it's releasing more heat out of the blood vessels via the blood and going to the skin surface, right? And sweating also, the, evac the action of the evaporation of the sweat on our bodies will help to cool us down. Now, when uh, external temperatures decrease, the blood vessels uh, first side, then they constrict. And so they're really, when it's cold out, your blood, your, the body wants to keep the blood closer to the core. So the core and the brain, making sure that oxid, that that blood is flowing in those areas and not so much to the extremities, to be honest, okay? So uh, secretions here, so the sebum, sebum is the oil that's being produced. It can have an antifungal, antibacterial properties. It also acts as a moisturizer. The sweat, again, involved in thermoregulation. Vitamin T. Vitamin D, uh, production begins in the skin, okay? Uh, many of us are deficient in vitamin D, and so good sources of vitamin D, as far as uh, nutrition-wise, dairy, egg yolks, uh, liver, sup liver and supplementation, and many of us, supplement. I, I, I would imagine the, the majority of the population, if you're not working outside on a regular basis, you need some type of supplementation, okay? Um, so 7-D hydrocholesterol uh, converts to cholecalciferol in the presence of UV light. The presence of sunshine travels in the blood and is modified in the liver and kidneys to form calcitriol, which is the active form of vitamin D, and very, it's a hormone. It's very important in processes that take place within the body, and it can also, I can tell you, just um, from a mood point of view, really, it can absolutely affect your mood and, and with low levels of vitamin D can lead to depression as well as other um, functions in the body that are inhibited. Excretion. So uh, this is why I mentioned earlier there about the, your, your quizzes that really even the integument can be a part of removal of waste. Not a whole lot, folks, but the sweat can contain water, sodium chloride, um, urea, uric acid, these are all formed as a result of protein metabolism, ammonia, right? But it's really insignificant into the, what the kidneys do as really releasing primary uh, waste products as, and also your uh, fecal matter in the digestive system. Now burns, this is quite interesting. There is a, uh, a video that I think that you should all try and check out. It's uh, called the, let's see, the burn gun or the, I think that's what it is. I'll have to look it up. I'll look it up and I'll share it with you. But it, it shows how patients with first and second degree burns uh, can receive treatment and they're still in the, the research phases, but can receive treatment and really cause a dramatic uh, decrease in the time that the healing can take place, as well as the less, the really minimal scar formation whatsoever. It's quite remarkable, the burn gun. I'll, I'll share that with you all. Uh, but first degree burns, second, third degree burns, we're going to look at those different types. We'll see the rule of nines, which gives, when you hear someone, oh, they've been burned over 45% of their body or greater numbers or lesser numbers. Well, how do we come about to figuring out that numbers, that percentage? You're going to see that in a moment. So here, as far as the rule of nines, so if the head is burned, right, 9%. Uh, the anterior trunk, posterior trunk, 18 and 18. Upper extremity, 9%, 9%. Lower extremity, 18 and 18. And the genital region, 1%. Okay? So depending upon how much of those areas, that's how we can kind of figure as far as percentage-wise what a patient is suffering from, okay? as far as burns are concerned over their entire body. Children, a little bit different because their proportions are different in comparison to the adult. Okay? Now, these types of burns, I like this, this image here because it's just showing you as far as, so the first degree burn, right? So we're having some uh, damage and insult to the epidermis. But then we get to the second degree burn and we're actually having going into the dermis layer and then a full thickness burn gets down past the dermis and into even the hypodermis, the subcutaneous layer. And these are the most difficult types of burns to work with. And, uh, you know, really, um, 
the treatment of burns uh, can be a very painful, uncomfortable uh, situation. This is the last slide here. And I want you to, to be able to observe this and to look at this because it shows you the ABCs of skin cancer and showing that it's important when you're looking at different spots on your body, right? If you, can, if you have spots on your body, uh, these moles and such, and these different types of birthmarks, so to speak, um, you should check and make sure that there's no changes going on and taking place because then this could be a possible uh, input that there could be a cancerous process going on. So A for asymmetry, so asymmetrical border. So you see here that there's a symmetry in the borders. Here there's an asymmetry to the border. Um, B for the border itself, you're seeing here that it's even hard to see the border here. You can see it here, but it's irregular. That's not good. The color, right? Um, white, blue, not so good as far as colorations are concerned, okay? Uh, diameter, if it's larger than a pencil eraser, that's also of, to be of concern. And evolving, if there's some type of change taking place in the markings of your body, then you should check that out. So not only just the shape and the color, but also if they begin to bleed or scab, uh, this could point to that there's changes going on that could be precancerous or actually cancer uh, issues going on. Okay.